Whether there's silence or sounds, whether there's speaking or not speaking, there's no difference. The difference is always just a seeming difference. And the problem with self is, <laughs> seeming problem, is that I think this difference is significant. There's significance in difference how this appears. And it's the same difference. Difference and same are not two. Until I say so. Yeah. <laughs> Break, I couldn't help but like things were um, um, unfolding, at, um, whatever you would say. And um, um, and I was reflecting upon that, although we have never met before, right? We've never met before, and yet the experience that I had in on the Zoom call was just this. It was like intimate and close. Mm -hmm. It was exactly that. So I'm just echoing what you're just saying. Yeah. Um, this is not, there's no difference, there's no, there's no difference. I mean, like, this is great and everything to see you in real, and stuff, <laughs> but the experience is just the same. Yeah. Just the same. Mm -hmm. Well, this, we're speaking of intimacy. Yeah. More intimate than even the imagination of oneness, which I fantasized self fantasizes is about becoming whole, becoming one. Well, that, this intimacy is unknowable. It's because what you've called yourself is this intimacy. This is intimacy, regardless, in spite of, despite of relationship. And self only can imagine intimacy in relationship to me. I am intimate with. That's the illusion. There is only <coughs> this intimacy, always and only. It doesn't move, it can't be lost. But for me, the bad news is, of course, you can't find it. It's not found. It can't, what, what can't be lost can't be found, can it? It's quite rational in that sense. It doesn't help, by the way, because I want help to find it. <coughs> That's the terrible dilemma. I've heard people speak that they've found it. They've, they've told me that they know and they've found it. Well, you can't find nothing, there's nothing to find. You can't lose nothing, there's nothing to lose. And by nothing, nothing isn't something. The problem again with me is I can, or conceptualizing, you can only conceptualize in thingness. So I make nothing a thing. And you hear that this is it, and so this is something that could be found, or that could be hidden. This can't be hidden. Or found. Or lost. But it can't be known. And the longing to know what you are is the same longing as to know what this is. So it's beautifully innocent, this seeking, this striving, this suffering that most human beings seem to live in, the sense that I am living a life separate from life. 
my separate life. And it's not for every human being is it intensely painful, but for many it is, it's unbearable. This seeming thrown out of heaven, you know, it's, it's cliched. That there is nirvana, there is heaven, it's somewhere else. And so I go, I go off looking for it. And in the seeming going off looking for it, it seems to be missed. That's all we're speaking of. So this is it, but it, it is not something. This is not an it. So language can vainly attempt to describe and point to, but there is no pointing, you know, you have to point in all directions. And even in pointing in all directions, you're not pointing at this. Because this doesn't have directions. This isn't located. There's no location. So the, the, the sense can be of being groundless, placeless, which is terribly disconcerting, terrifying for self. Well, where do I stand? Well, you don't stand. You've never stood. You have no ground. You have no being. You have no life. There is just ground, being, life. Whatever you can, you can say whatever word you want. <laughs> As if life, the complete disinterest, if it, if it does hit and it's undeniable that what you've called life, whatever fantasies you've had of what external being there is apart from me, that I might become one with, <laughs> if that becomes obvious or is obvious that it's just a fantasy, it's devastating. I mean, devastating in a way that I couldn't have imagined. And yet that is, <laughs> that is, completely at peace, at rest. Because it's, life isn't a certain way. There is no way. It's always no way. Uh, you said before that you cannot, uh, we cannot find it. Uh, could it be right to say that, you know, just if we play with words a little, that uh, it's rather that it finds me or it finds us, and in finding me, I, what I call usually I, disappears in a sense. You could say that. Okay. It means nothing, but yeah, no, but yeah, that's fine. Uh, I could say that as well. Yes. But you have to remember what anyone's ever said means nothing. I mean, that, that's the freedom. The freedom we're speaking of is there are no masters of life, <laughs> of knowing truth, of knowing reality. And then that, it, that is the end of the search. And it is the abyss. It's, you can't, there's nothing in its place. So if the search stops, if I stop, seemingly, there is nothing to fill that void. And that's terrifying for self, because 
most sales, the, what I fear most is empty. Because I don't have a place to stand. Well, where will I? Where will I exist? And what we're speaking of is that that question, the, the that question no longer arising, and then they're simply not knowing. And not knowing is incredibly easy, because that's as it is. You already don't know. There are no human beings who know who have this knowledge. That's the great lie. That's what the fuel of the search is. There are human beings who have found out or have been, whether you say they've found out for themselves or that God or the universe or consciousness or awareness or some creative external force has taken that from them and given the gift, it's neither. So although you're, what you said, you could say it that way, that is also just a story and that's not, that has no more truth to it than any other story. That's no more true than, you know, the rock band that I went to see last week, the story of that, or the story of life coming and taking me. It's just another story. There is no self to take. If, if there was a conviction here that there is, that you do have, a, you all have selves, I would not speak of this. Because <laughs> that would just be plain cruelty. <laughs> it would not be compassionate. And I don't know how it's obvious, but it is obvious in the absence of me that nothing is lost. And I mean that in the most... <clears throat> It's the most obvious thing that in the loss of what I feared most to lose, because what do I, what do I hold most dear? No matter what I tell anyone else, to myself I know myself is most precious to me. My sense of existence, my sense of I am. I would not give that up. I would not surrender to life if it came to take me. But there is no, that lie is, that, that lie, that I is a lie, is, is an empty illusion or, there's nothing, there's nothing there to lose. And so the wonderful news is that there's nothing to lose even what you fear to lose most, which is your life. So love, life is not in pieces, in parts, in this and that. The thingness of life is illusory. It's just not. But neither is it one. You know, there is, this isn't. There's, there's, I, there's no sense of oneness. Which, of course, that is what I was after. That's what I wanted most. To be one with, that connection. To, to feel whole. But the wholeness is empty. And by empty, I just mean it's just, there's no knowing. There's as much knowing as there is, and all of that knowing is empty. When I say not knowing, knowledge is exactly the same, but it's not, it has no weight or substance or power. Like everything, knowledge is, it's empty knowledge. And the emptiness is the freedom, is the peace, and most unbelievably of all is love. The only, the only reason why you might call this, why you might say life is unconditional, unconditionally loving, there isn't something loving, 
It's just that everything is as it is. And there are no exclusions. The lack of exclusivity, it's not, it's not even that everything's included. There aren't even, there aren't things to be included because there isn't anything to be separate. <laughs> so it's an inclusivity that is unspeakable, but very obvious. I, I make all divisions, I make all separations, I create them. I create all things. So of course that can, that again, that can sound special, but it is just this ordinary, spectacularly ordinary. There's no, there's no differentiation between extraordinary and ordinary. They, they, again, like all opposites, they just, oh yeah, well I just made those stories and they just, We've made that up. We make it up. We're making all this up as we go along. <laughs> and you no longer believe anyone or disbelieve them. You know, because it's, it's, there's, no, there's no substance to anyone's story. And that, that equality is, is wonderfully liberating. Because no one can get life right, and no one can get it wrong. Like babies, you know, not many human beings, adult human beings, judge babies for crying. Some do. <laughs> They're crying innocently. But as adults, because we have the conviction that I am in control, and so you must be. I'm responsible, so you must be. And then there's freedom to like and dislike whatever is preferred. You know, it doesn't mean you like everyone. In fact, there's much more freedom to dislike what's disliked. There's liberation for preferences. That's very liberating. There's nothing wrong with liking what I thought was what I shouldn't like. Like smoking. <laughs> Smoking's bad for you. It's antisocial. No one else likes you smoking. You don't like your smoking. So you should definitely stop smoking. So the absence of that conversation and the thought that you should stop smoking. Liberation for smoking. <laughs> Liberation for drinking. For all the things you thought were, you were conditioned to believe were wrong. All the parts of yourself that you rejected. So it's not that they're accepted. There's no sense of that. They no longer need acceptance. You know how hard you've worked on accepting the parts of yourself that need acceptance, to embrace them as you would a small child who's crying. You've maybe done some inner child work. I know I have. And um, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with that. But we're speaking of there's, there's no one to accept or reject. And that includes acceptance and rejection. So whether there's a sense of accepting or rejecting. <laughs> there's simply nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with me. There's nothing wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with the world. Don't tell anyone. They won't believe you. <laughs> there is only what I say is wrong. That's the only thing that makes anything wrong. There's only what I say is right. 
or what I think is right. So I was quite argumentative. I enjoyed an argument. I loved the competition of it, you know, that I could win being competitive self. And um, I don't notice so much now, but I did notice that there was no energy to argue. I had nothing to, I had no point to defend because it was very obvious I, I am is the point that the opinions, the beliefs, they're precious to me. That's all arguments, all conflicts are, that's what it's based on. So there's no fun in arguments, it's quite a loss really. No energy to do, you've got nothing to defend. There's no, I can't be bothered, it's far too much effort. <laughs> so you end up agreeing with everyone. <laughs> and they're happy because they think they've won the argument. <laughs> and, you're, and you're happy because you know you've not, they've not won the argument because you weren't, you weren't arguing. Because <laughs> there'd be no point. The absolute death of right and wrong, of righteousness, of good and evil, is an amazing blessing, you could say making it sound religious, but it is. I mean, there's just such peace in that. You know how hard you've tried to be right. And interestingly, then, you know, then, you're, then there's freedom to like and dislike without judgment, because liking and disliking is not judgmental. My cat, if I give it whiskers, will, <laughs> whiskers is <laughs> the preferred cat food of my cat, it will eat it straight down, you know, will, and want another packet straight away. I give it Felix, looks exactly the same, costs the same amount of money, won't touch it. Turns his nose and look, I might as well have shit in the tray. <laughs> you know, preference is natural, utterly. It's, it's animal. It's effortless. Whereas judging takes a lot of effort. It's painful. And of course, I judge my sh myself harshly so that I can improve. Most selves I know are much, much harder on themselves than they are on anyone else. And that's probably familiar to most of you. Most people thought I was quite kind and generous and considerate because that's the game I played in order to be accepted and liked by other people. And to myself, I was hardly ever those things. I was just constantly critical. Self-critical. Self-loathing. <laughs> Not all the time, you know, I liked praising myself as well. So that feels, you know, there, there is a real emptiness because all of that, if that stops, what is there, there is a lot of space without that internal dialogue. And so that's why I, when it, in the story of me, when self fell away, all I could say for weeks and weeks, months even, was, it's just so fucking empty. And the emptiness was really, th there was nothing going on. 
because the going on, what I'd call normal life for me, was all that internal dialogue, that analysis, that criticism, that explanation, that working out life in order to keep myself safe and to to avoid catastrophe, to avoid my life falling apart, keeping it all together. It turns out I was never doing any of that. No one's ever doing any of that. Just the story of me and my personal power. Yes. Thanks for that and um, reflecting on the body stuff and I didn't realise actually I had realised that something was still like a bit sort of like caught up somewhere or something so it's been good to talk about the body thing because now I've got more of a sense of um, like I definitely had like through my ideas of what my um, body was is um it gave me a sense of location all the time, mm. and um, so thanks. That's really just just the thing that needed um, a bit of um, something. So thanks. <laughs> yeah, like it was that. You know, what I mean, you've got to find a thing that that, that, that hooks you on. Yeah, well. yeah, and body. Yeah, that was definitely a hook. For mm. me. Yeah, so thanks. Yeah. So keep asking those questions, everyone, because it's just like it is in the questioning. Because you don't know, even even if you don't understand quite the question yet, it's still, yeah, yeah. Because I is very afraid of this this sense of, I long to not be located and imprisoned. This sense of, sense of being shut inside this body or shut behind these eyes, imprisoned, and so I long for freedom. So that I could get in front of these eyes and walk around out of this, this shell. And, and, the, the, and, there's, and there's, there's no way of knowing that whatever the sensations um, that are happening is, is a body. There's no way of knowing that. That was um, the following. Um. Yeah. Yeah, the, the body is, no is just an idea, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I've not quite been able to. Yeah, I wouldn't say pain is an idea. Mm. Pain is... Pain's very real. Physical pain. And emotional pain. Would you talk a little bit about love? Yeah, there, is, there isn't something called love. Just a word. <laughs> well, we talked a bit about this yesterday, but you know, love has so many what each person means when a human being says the word love, there's no telling what they mean by it because it has so many meanings. And so you never know. And like everything else that's spoken about, the word isn't a thing. Isn't a thing. There are no... The words make it sound like something. The reason I speak about unconditional love is because this is without exclusion. You know, this is all-inclusive, and that's unconditional. And the sense of unconditionality, <laughs> the word that comes up to describe that, and it's, it's, it's a pathetic attempt. I mean, it isn't. There isn't a thing. Love is not what it is. <laughs> and it's, it's not loving 
in the relational sense that we usually talk about love between because there's no in between there's no two things in love there's just this unconditional happening appearance however you whatever words resonate for you just and that <laughs> feels like love because there is nothing it's because there is nothing rejected it's that lack of rejection of any appearance which is just the opposite of how life was for me. I was always accepting or rejecting. I was always judging. And, that, and by the way, the, the wonderful thing about this unconditional love is that, of course, it accepts rejection just as much as acceptance. Rejecting is fully, is fully included. There aren't any exclusions. Hatred is just as much unconditional love. It doesn't make sense to me. It's not a love that is recognized by me. My love is always conditional. It can't not be. Because it's relational. So there is no unconditional love. Unconditional love is just meaningless, pathetic, futile attempt to describe everything being nothing, nothing being everything. No opposites. That's the unconditional nature of what we're speaking of and why non-duality is usually the term for what we're speaking of. It's an awful phrase, isn't it? I hate it. It's just because it sounds so dry. And yet what we're speaking of isn't dry at all. It's not philosophical. Because philosophy is about knowledge. And this requires no knowing. Could you say it, it is just life? Just life's okay, yeah. yeah. I, I, I say that sometimes. Yeah, yeah just life. I, the two words that I find the least... <laughs> Well, the, the, the least, create the least arguments are this and life. Total acceptance. No, there's no, it doesn't feel like acceptance at all. I have to say that because that, that acceptance is all for me. This is completely regardless of acceptance and rejection. Rejection is just as much unconditionally loving unconditional love as acceptance you're out of a job because my job is acceptance and rejection that's that's how i work that's how self works and it could it might just be obvious the, so, is, <laughs> the phrase that comes up all the time is so what you know it's everything everything is so what everything is insignificant and in the utter insignificance of everything, there's the unconditional love. Nothing is more significant than anything else. No events are more significant. So all your awakening experiences that you've held as special, dead as a dodo in their significance, utterly like your dream smashed, because of course that was the dream, the dream of that was special. That makes me special. That makes me on the path to becoming really special. So nothing is special. There are no things to be more special than other things. This isn't one, nor is it many, <laughs> nor is it two, nor is it nothing. And it's all of those. You can't do anything with it. There's nothing to be done with life. And in that, anything can seemingly be done. That's the freedom. 
But no doing is more, is higher or lower than another. No thought, no feeling. <laughs> is better or worse. One is preferable, you know, you would prefer, you know, <laughs> you would prefer kindness than hatred and aggression. Again, it's just natural. But that doesn't make one better or higher or more noble or more spiritual or more holy. All of those, all of those concepts that we hoped would bring us closer, home even, this fantasy of coming home. That was my fantasy. It didn't happen. I did not come home. There is no home to come to or to leave. That is home. This is, this isn't home, it's all there is. Because home implies that there's not home. <laughs> I could be, or paradise, or heaven, or nirvana, or any <coughs> other fantasy that human beings have come up with throughout time and written about the place you could get to where everything would be okay. There is no other place and there's no you to travel to that place. And of course, that is absolute rest. This, regardless of what is happening, is at absolute rest. That's the absolute. You don't know the rest. You don't know because the rest is unmoving. The best analogy I've got, I think, is deep sleep. We know nothing of deep sleep. Nothing. You could say it's absolutely empty of knowing. I don't mean dream sleep, but you know, because dream sleep isn't often that great, is it? A lot of my dreams are shit, and I'd rather not have them. But deep sleep, there is a longing for that, a longing to not know, a longing to be absent, absent of awareness, absent of, <laughs> of being separate. And that's, you could say this is just like deep sleep, where there's nothing going on, nothing with nothing going on. And then this, awake, is everything going on, but the everything going on is nothing going on. Rubbish. <laughs> uh, sometimes my descriptions, I can't help but be critical of them. It's pathetic, really. <laughs> but that's okay. That does happen still. I'm not saying judgment of what comes out. Oh, that, 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 was, that was poor. That was a poor attempt. Because <laughs> this is all futile attempts, all of it. That's why you can never, you, you, I never say anyone's wrong when they say whatever they say. What anyone ever says about this, it's never wrong. Because it's never right. Isn't that wonderful though? That no one could ever be right about life. Isn't that the most brilliant news? I know for the one who wants to know, it's fucking dreadful. It's hopeless. And you'll have heard that term lots of times if you've listened to non-duality speakers. But the, the hopelessness, <laughs> the absence of the hope, the one who hoped, doesn't feel hopeless at all. It's very odd. Hopeless is not a feeling of hopelessness at all. Because really what I mean, what self means when it says hopeless, is means there's no hope. But if hope loses its meaning, it doesn't mean anything because there's no future to hope for where this might be, I might be fulfilled and this might 
I might get what I want, then the absence of that is the absence of hopeless as well. So it's the same with meaning, because I, I quite often say, you know, there is no meaning, this is meaningless and purposeless. <laughs> but the absence of purpose is the absence of purposelessness. And the absence of meaning is the, the death of meaning is the death of meaningless. You just don't know what anything means. If, if, there's, if it's obvious that you don't know what anything means, well, there is no meaning or meaningless. Meaningless loses its meaning. What's, say the question again, because I can't remember. Um, it was something that, that Jim spoke about, which, which, which uh, I really love. And it was the fact that this, this happening is the mystery. That's it. Okay. That this happening is a mystery. Uh, is, is the mystery. Is the mystery. <laughs> oh, how much more special could you make it than the mystery? Not any old mystery. The mystery. <laughs> And um, the wonder is that there is no mystery. There's only mystery. There isn't the mystery. This isn't mysterious. It's the end of the difference between ordinary and mysterious. Of knowing and not knowing. There's no... Th that's just another story that I've told myself. That there's... Mystery really just means I don't know. That's all mystery is, isn't it? So there's this, well, I know what's going on most of the time. Ordinary life, which I know. Not true. <laughs> and then there's happenings that are, whoa, what the fuck happened there? Mystery. I don't know what happened there. All mystery. Ordinary and mystery not to. That's my answer. <laughs> it's just, it's just, a, the mystery is just another distinction that I make, pretending that I know usually, and then, but this happening, that happening, that event, I don't know. I don't know what happened there. All mystery, all ordinary. All not known, completely known, without any knowing. You don't need to know what's going on for going on to be the only thing that's going on. Do you? <laughs> so you can, if you say it either way, all mystery, only mystery, no mystery at all, same. Yeah. No distinction between knowing and not knowing. And really, you could say that's the, that's the duality. There is what I know, which is apart from the mystery. I'm bored with what I know. And I'm convinced there is a lot more to find out to solve the mystery. There is no solution. <laughs> None required. This is not a problem. Doesn't need solving.
And your yes. question. Uh, well, you know, this is uh, the first time ever I listen to you share. Uh, so I am a bit curious uh, and uh, wanted to ask you if uh, you could uh, tell a little about your illusory story. <laughs> and uh, you, I, I noticed you used the expression sometime earlier uh, that... Uh, uh, at one point, uh, your your self dropped away, or your illusory self dropped away, or something like that. Yeah. And uh, I am just curious to know, you know, uh, something about your own story, your own search, and uh, and uh, this event or non-event or whatever you call it, when mm -hmm. your illusory self dropped away. Yeah. Because sometimes, you know, it can be very uh, inspiring for uh, people like myself who still imagine that uh, I am an illusory self, you know, yeah. to hear uh, uh, about uh, the story of somebody like you. Yeah. So, uh, would, you, would you be willing to share a little <laughs> bit of that, you know? Yeah, I can, uh, I can, I can, uh, yeah. Just to satisfy my... my Curiosity. Yeah, perhaps a few others will be curious. Well, first I'd say there wasn't an event. No, no. that's why I, no. I said event or non-event. You did say that. You're very good. Well done. <laughs> good work. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Um, <laughs> no, so the event that I was waiting for mm. didn't happen. Mm. Because nothing happens. Mm. You know, this happening doesn't happen. Because, you know, if it, a happening is an event, there are, you know, separate events, there are happenings, there are no happenings. And so the whole, the, all storytelling is just that. Is, but I can tell a story. What do you want to know, though? Because I'm not going to tell you my whole life story. <laughs> so, no, I, well, I, I which bits do you I want? I imagine that at, at, at one point you were a seeker. You kind of yeah. indicated that. Oh, that, yeah. That, uh, were there any any uh, people along your road that especially kind of inspired you and uh, yeah uh, and uh, when do you came to that realization that there, there was uh, nothing to attain etc and uh, and uh, how did it impact you or there was no you then left to be impacted or however you want to phrase it oh that's a lot Yes. So, 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 well, That's a lot of story. Yes, but you know. Uh, Read my book. Oh, you. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but then maybe a, a, a okay, uh, Yeah, I was. Um, well, I. The whole. It's, it's now very. It seems very obvious that self is the seeker. Seeking is self. Mm -hmm. Self is seeking. Mm -hmm. This energy that we call myself mm -hmm. is the energy of not good enough, mm -hmm. not complete, incompletion. Yes. And so you, most of my seeking was what you call ordinary seeking, material seeking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Everyday, normal life seeking, not spiritual. Right. Um, but then I, there were, I had regular episodes of terrible self-doubt, which is usually diagnosed as depression. And so uh, each one of those, as I came out of it, I would find a new, I would, what self does is find a path out, you know, from my suffering. So most of my seeking was psychological. Mm -hmm. So I, I sought to understand <coughs> myself. That's really, that's what most of my seeking was from about the age of 20 to 40. Yeah, till about late 30s, probably 20 years. And that was therapy, reading lots of self-help, as well as psychology, studying psychology, and eventually training to be a therapist, because that seemed like the ultimate way to understand myself, was to study self academically, and then to help others. Now I understand myself, I can then help others to understand their selves. Particularly this notion of acceptance, because it felt, you know, self often feels self-rejecting. So that was most of my seeking. 
but then I had this awakening experience or whatever we're going to call it and it was never quite the same after that so <laughs> I wanted to know what that experience was and so because that I remember I came back from that experience and it was it was incredible and I just wanted to tell everyone and I told a number of people the first person I told I was a school teacher and I came back and I told my deputy head who was a friend of mine and I said well she wanted to know how it had gone I'd taken the kids away that's when this experience I was leading a group of children trekking in the in the Peak District in the hills and um, the only thing I wanted to tell was this experience so I told her this and I just uh, it's still very vivid and I told her this is the this is the greatest thing that's ever happened to me and I told her and I, I these are the most profound words I've ever spoken you know it's the most sublime the most amazing and I could there was just this complete and utter blank. It did not, nothing registered. She did not reply. She didn't actually say anything. It was like she didn't hear a single word of it. And she went, oh, I'm glad you had a nice time. And that was, you know, it was like, it was, like, no, you haven't heard. So of course I tried quite a few of my other friends and family, same. So then I thought, well, there must be, there must be someone who will acknowledge, because you want acknowledgement of this experience, to share it. So then that was when I started being a, you could say, a spiritual seeker. But not in the sense of, I just wanted to know what this experience, what did it mean? Who else had had one, something similar? What was it about? It was... You know, this, this, this curtain's being drawn back and there's this. What does that mean? And then I became a non-duality seeker. And the first person, the first, the first, um, <laughs> the first acknowledgement of that experience really came from a guy called Jeff Foster, who I'm sure you all have heard mm -hmm. of. And he was a really young man. He just started speaking. And there was one YouTube clip of him speaking and um, and I saw that he was doing a talk and so that then it was the next day and I just got in my car and I just drove down to sit with Jeff Foster and um, there were about five people there I mean he's, he's very famous now he, he appears in you know um, top hundred last time I looked he was like 46 in the top hundred most influential spiritual human beings on earth today <laughs> but at that time he was speaking in a church room in Eastbourne down on the south coast and that's where I went to see him and from then on uh, I was an addict really I was bitten <laughs> and couldn't let it go but I just went I just hopped from one one speaker to another one book to another hoping to find what I was looking for. And then suddenly you stopped doing that. What was that? It wasn't sudden. No. no. There was nothing sudden about this. It was just excruciatingly slow in the story. There was no sudden revelation. There was nothing to be revealed. It's the most terrible revelation, isn't it? That I was looking for something and there was nothing to find. You, you told about this uh, stopping your uh, suddenly if you're not able to work anymore and you had some weeks of just crying and this emptiness. Yeah, and I can't really in memory I can't piece it together or how long each how long each part of the journey seemed to take. It's it, it, I will say none of it means anything at all anymore. I mean, whilst I was in it, it meant everything. The, while I was in it, it 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 was the whole it was the whole universe was my search, my suffering, my pain, my journey. 
until it wasn't. And when it wasn't, I didn't know it wasn't. I mean, that, I mean, talk about disappointing. That's why I always emphasize this is not what I was looking for. In any sense, there was no revelation. So <laughs> the awakening experience and what I speak of, although they seem as though they, I may be speaking about the same thing, and in a way, of course, everything is the same thing. There is this nothing. They have no, there's no connection between them. All it seems is that was the catalyst in the story. There we are. I was always waiting to know the absence of myself. That's what I longed for. And of course there is no knowing that. There's nothing to know. I do remember a period where I didn't get out of bed for weeks other than to go to the toilet and to eat something. <laughs> and that, that appeared like depression. Most of my friends and family thought I was depressed and it was, it was the absolute opposite of depression, which is complete being consumed with myself, isn't it? It's like, it's, it's so, depression is absolutely full of what did you everything. Think? It what was did you think just it was, totally empty. What did you think it was at the time? The, the, the seeming depression. Did you think it was the depression? Or no. no. No, not at all. Most everyone else did. Yeah. What did you think it was? <laughs> Empty. Because the seeming emptiness seems to take some getting used to when I've been filled with me and my journey and, and the, the complete absence of motivation to become, which is really, it seems obvious that that's what, I was that I that sense of I am is that that drive that neediness that and the absence of that is just incredibly empty but there was one <laughs> I did I remember that I'd been like this for weeks seemingly and it suddenly dawned Oh, this is the peace that passes all understanding because it was so obvious that the em what felt dreadful the emptiness was completely at peace it wasn't that I was at peace there was just peace and moving and seemingly that takes a lot of getting used to compared with how life had been so in the story then there was quite a long period of I don't know it's like this body getting used to it of having no motivation really what it felt like there was motivation natural motivation I didn't go hungry I didn't neglect myself it wasn't like being yeah. depressed which is it's self-loathing, really, so you really, do, you know, it's almost consciously neglect yourself because you hate yourself. It was the absence of, it seemed like the absence of everything. And there's a story. It doesn't mean anything at all. And when I tell that story, it, it, it doesn't feel like my story. And that's hard, that's, well, you can't convey that in words. But there's, there's no energy to that. There's no, it doesn't have any. It, <laughs> it's, it's a personal story. But the, the power that a personal story has is that it is mine without that sense of it belonging to me. It's just another story. Um, 
And there's no significance in stories. No significance in anything. At all. <clears throat> and I would have never guessed that that's, that's what was meant by the peace that passes all understanding. The, the utter insignificance of everything that I'd held dear. They essentially don't mean a thing. I bring, I brought all meaning to my life. <laughs> life doesn't have any, there's nothing intrinsically meaningful or intrinsically significant. I have to be a part and, and I have to create, I create all that. Because I was so afraid of being nothing. I mean, most, most self's greatest fear is being a nobody, being, a, being insignificant, meaningless. I can't, you know, I can't bear the thought of being pointless, you know. I think that must be because um, uh, a person comes to selfhood by um, the reaction they get from their mother yeah. or their primary caregiver. Mm -hmm. That's what actually, uh, and, and so of course if, if nobody ever looks at you and responds to you, uh, then your self is effectively invisible. Yeah. And that, that would be terrifying. Dreadful. Yeah. And yet that is the liberation. The freedom is in that, that it might be obvious that you've never been seen. No one's ever seen you. That longing that you had to be known by another. The illusion of connecting. There's no connection. There's no separation to be connected. It's really interesting how by being in it's that suddenly you are by being here, suddenly something again by I know it's not personally, but still it kind of from from being something before as suddenly maybe not an identity, but still as it just What do you mean me sitting here speaking about it? I know that in there suddenly you are you are something again. I'm somebody. Something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it is funny because I fantasized a lot about doing this. You may have done the same. Mm. I did. <laughs> yeah, I sat. I uh, I had I had years of sitting in front of Tony. Then, yeah, he's pretty good. I'd do better than that. <laughs> so how does I mean, it go? that is self. That's what self does. So how does it go? Is it better than Tony? <laughs> it, would be, it would be very remiss of me to be the judge of that, wouldn't it? <laughs> it's the end of, you know, that's, that's... There's no one getting this right or wrong. Just preferences. So it's just very natural that you're not preferring one speaker over another, one way of talking about this. <laughs> but the nature of being human is you can't help but put all the non-duality speakers in an order of priority, an order of superiority. Yeah, they're the clearest. And you could do on different criteria. I used to play that game. So on um, <laughs> compassion, oh yeah, she's top. On clarity, yeah, definitely him and... Well, maybe they're equal, yeah. Uh, yeah, all those sort of games. But then you just, if they're seen for the games that they are, then it doesn't mean anything. Tim, can I have something? Um, yeah. Uh, I recently uh, had a... Uh, conversation with a good friend of mine who's a sort of um, 
um, psychologist. Uh, and um, we had quite lengthy um, debate about whether what I was describing to him was had any meaning or not. Of course, I mean, I knew that from a scientific point of view, there was no way he could ever accept what I was trying to describe. Mm -hmm. um, uh, because his whole point, science requires an objective observer who can somehow yeah. stand outside a mm -hmm. phenomenon. And I was saying, no, no, you yeah. are embraced within that because you are part of the all and everything and yeah. the whole thing. But he, one, one thing he said to me, he said, so how do you explain um, that everyone on the planet, uh, well, uh, massive generalization, that a lot of people are walking around under the illusion that their self has developed and psychology explains through attachment theory and stuff like that, yeah. the development of a self mm -hmm. in relation with the mother and so on. How do you explain that? He says, because there's, if it's something that's so prevalent mm -hmm. in the world, it has to have some evolutionary advantage. To oh, it. I don't doubt that for a minute. What, do, what is self? Utterly selfish. It's, uh, if I'm talking scientifically, it makes perfect sense why virtually all human beings have a sense of self. Because by being self-centered, your survival, what is evolution if not a survival, you know, a theory of survival of the fittest? Well, a human being with a self is more likely to survive than one without. Evolutionary. Mm. Yeah, it makes perfect sense to me. I mean, it doesn't mean anything, but that, so yeah. if I was arguing, yeah. that, that's no, what I, I would course, say. I mean, evolution is just one more story. Because what, so the whole, the whole energy of self is to keep me safe, to look after myself. That's what relations are, it's like relationships are all about that. Yeah. I cultivate relationships because I'm much safer if you're on my side and I do things for you, and then you will do things for me, and if we're attacked, it will keep me so, so if the tigers come, then I'm more likely to survive. So in survival of the fittest, all the enlightened ones would die first. <laughs> <laughs> the, the thing about this is, is it's nothing to do with altruism, you know. Altruism is essentially self. Centered. Selfless. <laughs> the term selfless, which is funny because this look putting others before myself, is equally as selfish as self centered as putting myself first. Because I put yourself first rather than myself. Well, it's, yeah. it's just another way that self tries to manage life to keep myself safe. Nobody's doing any of that. But. So yeah, I think as from an evolutionary point of view, it makes perfect sense why human beings have evolved that naturally a sense of being self-centered, being inside and having this conviction that I'm in, I'm in control is beneficial for survival. So, that's my scientific theory. Yeah, makes sense. <laughs> within yeah, that, within that. But again, that. evolution is just evolution. There is no evolution. This doesn't evolve. I mean, the, science dies along with religion with this. Scientific, you know, scientific explanations are no more significant anymore. I was quite a devout atheist you know, worshipping science as knowledge, you know, that science would produce the answers. Like Hitchhiker's Guide, you know, the answer is 42. If you, ultimately, we will, science will find the answer. He was a funny man, Douglas, wasn't he? <laughs> the, and the answer ultimately is found by science, and the answer is 42. I mean, it's utterly meaningless. And of no benefit to humanity at all after this, you know, mil hundreds of millennia of research and scientific evolution. But, but his point is you can't know the answer and the question at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. 
And in a very real sense, so you, there's no interest in questions anymore because the questions and the answers are not two. You know, answers just create another question. There's, that's science, isn't it? Science really, that's what science is. So science answers, a, science is the answer to a question and the, quest, the answer just creates the next question. There's no end. So, uh, I have a question. Good. <laughs> um, it sounds like that the meaning um, um, appears because, because of the relation to other persons. So, my, my, I have to be my mind now. Uh, imagine um, there's a child growing up without, uh, with parents that are not there. And, but it is really like that that uh, me appears because of the relation to other persons, or maybe it's just by itself? Everything is by itself. And not even that. There isn't a self by itself, but you know. There's no, there's no answer to that, is the answer. How would we know that? Yeah. So, you know, the story that I've just told about um, why the self is evolutionary, <laughs> that it, that's just a meaningless story. But can I just say, uh, the, the thing is, Marcus, in what you've just described there, um, if a child never received any feedback from somebody who cares for them, psychologically speaking, that child would die. Sim simply will not survive. Yeah, but my question is like, when the parents are, uh, don't have a me, so if the child still the developer. Mm. That's the question. I know it's a bit weird. Yeah, there's, I mean, it's just hypothetical. But hy hypothetically, I would say, yeah, of course they'll develop a me. It's, not, it's nothing to do with the parent. Yeah. It's nothing to do with anything. <laughs> And there aren't any parents without me. There aren't. Because without a me, it's just exact, it's, it's only, only exists because of me. So there isn't, an, this is, this is, the, <laughs> this is probably the most disappointing thing about this whole message is that of course, if you hear this, then you're waiting. I am waiting until I know the absence of myself. Well, there is nothing to be absent. There's nothing to lose. So the absence of something that doesn't, isn't existent is... There is no more a no me than there is a me. <laughs> By that, what I mean is the absence of me, it, there, is, there is, is not a loss. In the seeming losing, it feels like total loss, but there is nothing that can be lost. There is only this, and there is nothing, there is nothing here to be lost. There is only stories of gaining and losing, you know, and they are just stories. So there is, <laughs> there's no, <laughs> there's no human beings with a me or without a me. I know. That's why when somebody said earlier, you know, do when I do I look at, because <laughs> someone said, oh, you must be able to tell from the energy. There must be from the energy when you meet another empty 
this, this, <laughs> this guy has got it in his head that there are full human beings, full of themselves, full, fulls and empties. He's taking it that I'm an empty. And therefore, as an empty, I can recognize other empties. <laughs> Hilarious. But it is a spiritual story that's told. Mm. I know. What a story that is. I mean, talk about superior to make myself special. I, I have the ability as being non-existent, I now have got the ability to recognize other non-existents. Bloody hell. It's, the, it's such a fantasy of, you know, how special I could be. I think there are lots of gurus who make plenty of money out of that. You do make good money. More mo <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course, because what, what a wonderful thing on offer. I mean, that's what, you know, on offer is the possibility, the chance, it might be a slim chance, but it's still worth going for, that you could be a no one. And there's, there's throughout history, there's been very few. And nearly all of them have been worshipped. Well, that's fairly attractive. Would you say... <laughs> Could you say, Tim, people, people that meet that do have this, um, um, uh, way or whatever you're, you're trying to communicate, have a, have a, a sense of great, um, amicableness? What? Towards me? No, to, toward, you know, people that, um, don't have so much of a me, I don't know how to describe it. <coughs> There's quite a sense of amicable <coughs> about them. I, well, all I can say is I do like most. Mm. Yeah. So, I like I, most of you, I, but not all of you. Or people not able to like recognize other people that may have um, different perspectives. But I think there is some sort of sense of amicableness or resonance. Yeah, well, I mean, I loved, I mean, the reason I, one of the reasons I kept going to Tony Parsons meetings was to meet, just to be with the other people there. That was, once I thought I'd got it, you know, I understood, uh, there was nothing more for me to learn. I wasn't going there to get something. I was going there to be with the others because it was lovely. So I'd say I was really seeking knowledge for about five years. And then the next five years was I was mainly going. The motivation was, oh, yeah, it'd be great to be. So the, the cafe and the bar afterwards was the, the meeting was you'd put up with it to go to the cafe and just be with the, the lovely people. Yeah. <laughs> And I'd, yeah, that's, I'd say that's still how it is, really. Well, thanks very much for coming again, and um, I hope you've got nothing. <laughs> Take nothing away. <laughs>